Tonight, the standoff in Vancouver as the city tries to move out dozens living in an encampment. What would you guys think if somebody came to your home? The city says it's about keeping people safe, but where will everyone go? No power. Oh my God. Tornadoes, freezing rain, blackouts, the monster storm with tens of millions in its path. And as your grocery bills soar, so does the salary of the man in charge of Lawbrooks. How can he get a raise when we're paying too much for food? This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, tensions have come to a head in downtown Vancouver where police swept in and cleared out an encampment that stretched several city blocks for months. But before that clear out could happen, there was a standoff of sorts with officers lined up in force on one side and encampment members and their supporters on the other. Now that the encampment is all but gone, some have sworn to come back. Susanna De Silva takes us through how we got here and where this could go next. It started early and they moved fast. It was expected, but unexpected because it was pretty freaking early. Streets were blocked, dump trucks moved in, and people living in the encampment had to clear out. What was left behind trashed. Cressy Poirier has been living here for two years. Make sure that it's all clean, make sure that there's a pathway for the people, the elders. So they left us alone and until today. The city said it had to clear two city blocks, an estimated 80 structures, down from 180 at its peak in the summer when the fire chief first called for their removal. This year alone we have had reported 16 tent fires in that area. Local businesses have been damaged, resulting in fires and numerous explosions, which make it dangerous for anybody walking down that street. A danger felt by some living nearby. I've been assaulted twice, just trying to come home from grocery shopping, going through my front door. I had a guy come after me with a hatchet. Crews made quick progress, flanked by police. And that's what we're doing down here, is surviving, because that's all we can do, because there's nothing left for us. Until tensions grew this afternoon as advocates tried to slow the process. The street was eventually cleared, but the question all day no one could really answer, where would everyone go? All they're required to do is give them a card to go to housing. We have no housing. There is no housing. A fact the city acknowledged. And the odds of us being able to provide 100 shelter spaces today, we couldn't commit to that. And it's a fact those here know too well. Smarten up, quit wasting money. Like, get us a home. Where are you going to go? Uh, probably out back. I wait a day or two and I'll come right back. So, Susie, uh, those people who are living in the tents, where did they go? Well, that's a good question. We were just talking to an advocate a short time ago. He said he's not even really sure, but that in an alley nearby, there's a tent there, and that seems to be where a lot of people have gone to alleys, streets, whatever corners they can find in the area nearby, other parks. Uh, the street here itself, you already see a lot of people, a lot of belongings are back on the sidewalk. A few people tried to set up tents already uh, after the city crews moved out, but those have been taken down. But keep in mind, there have been 10 tent encampments taken down in the city of Vancouver over the last decade. There's more more housing being promised, but advocates are saying that's simply not enough. Adrian. All right, Susanna Da Silva in Vancouver, thank you. Tens of millions of Canadians and Americans are taking stock of the damage tonight caused by a huge storm system that's carving a path right through both countries. So take a look at the size of it, stretching from deep in the U.S. south to up past the Great Lakes from Manitoba to the Maritimes. But what that system brought depends on where you live. Many Canadians are now cleaning up from an ice storm, others digging out from snow, while in the U.S., another major tornado has brought new destruction and new pain. So let's begin here in Canada, where nearly a million customers lost power today. Marina von Stackelberg shows us the damage and disruptions caused by all that ice. 
Firefighters had to cut a fence to help morning commuters trapped in one of Ottawa's light rail trains. Freezing rain had caused ice to build up, stopping trains on their tracks. Actually, we, we were stuck for about maybe more than 45 minutes. Everyone was fine, just a bit annoyed, and then we got pulled out by the firefighters. Ottawa's whole train system brought to a halt. I will ask customers to be patient with us. I know it's frustrating, and I can fully understand. In Quebec, people were urged to stay off the roads. Trees walloped by howling winds and weighed down by heavy ice crushed parked cars on Montreal's streets. They also took out wires, leaving hundreds of thousands of households without electricity in western Quebec and eastern Ontario. Southern Ontario got thunder and lightning with freezing pellets, hail and torrential rain. Further west, the same weather system brought snow. Not surprising for April in Winnipeg, but still unwelcome. This time of the year, I think we're done with it. Started to put away our winter coat. <laughs> Have to take it out again. <laughs> Shoveling snow again, sort of like, uh, wow. Okay, Nora. Though some were happy with the spring surprise. Snow itself is always fun. They're always excited when there's a fresh snow. Back in Ottawa, commuters that usually take the train stood in the freezing rain as they waited for replacement buses to get them back home. Hopefully I don't have to wait too long in this bad weather, but uh, I'm not looking forward to my experience home. For April, this is not, this is like global warming for sure. You know, cause normally we don't get this kind of weather in April. So that's a shocker to the system. But you know, as Canadians, we roll with it, right? So Marina, you're outside one of those train stops tonight. Any word on when service might resume? We asked City of Ottawa officials if it would be hours, days or weeks. They told us they don't know when the system will be back up and running. Now, this is the second time this winter that Ottawa's entire light rail system has been shut down completely because of freezing rain. Now, we also know that a via rail train traveling south of Ottawa near Brockville had to stop when it hit a tree that was on the tracks. Via says everyone is OK. Now, as for this storm, Adrian, well, it has its sights now set on the Maritimes. What a mess. Marina von Stackelberg in Ottawa, thank you. Now, south of the border, cleanup is underway from that latest deadly twister in Missouri. As Paul Hunter shows us, it now joins the growing list of destructive storms that have hit communities there. In a season of wild and powerful tornadoes throughout the U.S., Midwest and South, this one in Iowa Tuesday seemed straight out of Hollywood. Look at that road. Oh my God. Almost otherworldly. Wow. As it ripped its way onward. No power. Oh my God. This is Western Illinois. Oh my God. And the same storm system that hit nearby Iowa. Yeah, I'm okay. Are you guys? Okay. Oh my God. Leaving a landscape increasingly familiar in this country. This is that same town in Illinois once the storm had passed by. In Glen Allen, Missouri, south of St. Louis, early Wednesday, another tornado killed at least five people. We actually got a notification on my wife's phone that went off, so we knew something was coming. The power went off and the house just started shaking. It was uh, a lot of cracking, loud wind. So we ran inside, ran in the bathtub, and it was in a matter of seconds, and then it just hit, and it was just awful. Just You could hear the house just, I don't know, it sounded like it was getting destroyed. The past few weeks have seen dozens of tornadoes in the U.S. So far this year, there have been nearly 500. That's double the average number by early April. All in, more than 60 people have been killed. In Arkansas, the big one from last week, they're still dealing with the mess left behind. Likewise, in Indiana, one of eight states struck just this past weekend. I couldn't even get across the room. And boom, it was a bomb went off. And it's not just treacherous twisters. In a number of places, including Iowa, hail. Some of the hailstones this big. And as those who made it through this latest round wonder what now lies ahead for their lives, it is with the new certainty in this country there will be more of this ferocity to come. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. More violence tonight in Jerusalem at one of the holiest sites in both Islam and Judaism. And it's unfolding 
during one of the holiest times for people of both faiths. Margaret Evans is in Jerusalem tonight where there are concerns the situation could get even worse. For the second night in a row, clashes have broken out between Israeli police and Palestinian worshippers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Last night, Israeli security forces stormed the mosque in the compound known to Muslims as the Noble Sanctuary. Images on social media appeared to show Israeli soldiers beating Palestinian worshippers on the ground with batons. Israeli authorities say they were removing agitators who'd barricaded themselves inside. They released footage showing firecrackers being thrown at them as they entered. Clashes spread to other parts of the city and more than 300 Palestinians were arrested. The Islamic Waqf, which administers the site, condemned the raid, accusing Israel of upsetting the status quo on shared religious sites in Jerusalem. There is agreement between uh, Jordan, Israel and the rest of the world that Israel does not make changes in the, station, uh, the situation of Al-Aqsa Mosque. The site is sacred to both Muslims and Jews who call it the Temple Mount. By morning, Israeli soldiers were accompanying Jewish visitors to the compound. Their presence seen as a provocation by many Palestinians, especially given the new role for hardline nationalist religious Jews in Israel's new government. It was very, very clear that their goal is to demolish Al-Aqsa Mosque and to build in instead the temple. In the wake of the clashes, militants in Gaza fired more than a dozen rockets at Israel, answered in turn by Israeli airstrikes. <laughs> Israeli defense minister visited Israel's Iron Dome defense system. We will know how to hit anyone who tries to attack us, he says, to impose a heavy price on them. Several countries, Canada included, have voiced concern, calling for calm, especially at this time when the Jewish holiday of Passover and the Muslim holy month of Ramadan coincide. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Jerusalem. Four children are dead after a man stormed a daycare in southern Brazil wielding a machete. At least five other children were hurt in the attack. The 25-year-old man then turned himself into police. Investigators say the suspect doesn't appear to be connected to the school or the children. The local mayor says he will declare 30 days of mourning. And several Canadian women and their children, who were long held in Syrian detention camps, are on their way back to Canada tonight. The camps were for suspected ISIS members and their families. As Ashley Burke tells us, what is not clear is what will happen to them when they arrive. A long journey home that began here in northeastern Syria, where a group of Canadian women and their children have been held at camps for suspected ISIS members and their families. It's been more than three years that we've been trying to get them out of these detention camps, and uh, it appears as though uh, they're on their way home. In January, the federal government struck a last-minute deal to repatriate 19 Canadian women and children before a federal court decision would have forced it to. I've spoken with their families here in Canada, and uh, to put it mildly, they are over the moon, excited uh, that their loved ones are coming home. But not everyone who wanted to come got on the plane. There's no chance, as far as I understand, of my clients or their children being on that flight. This lawyer represents two foreign mothers with Canadian children not part of the federal government's deal. She says they faced an ultimatum from Canadian officials, send their children to Canada without them or not at all. The offer here is to separate already extremely traumatized children from the sole provider that they've had. These six children belong to a Quebec mother given the same difficult choice. The Prime Minister wouldn't comment on that. The situation in northeastern Syria is incredibly volatile. Uh, it is uh, of uh, real concern uh, to everyone around the world, and Canada is watching very, very closely and uh, engaged uh, with uh, all of our responsibilities. They've been in a camp for a long while. This former executive manager at CSIS doesn't believe the women are a national security risk. I don't see them as posing a threat, but they may actually 
have assisted ISIS in some capacity. But says they could face criminal charges. Maybe they were compelled to, or maybe they voluntarily in some capacity were radicalized and, and assisted the terrorist groups, in which case they would be subject to a criminal investigation. So, Ashley, we have seen consequences after other similar repatriations. That's right, Adrian. Two women repatriated last year from northeastern Syria were both arrested when the plane touched down on Canadian soil. One is facing a terrorism-related peace bond, the other four terrorism-related offenses. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. China is threatening retaliation after a meeting between the president of Taiwan and the U.S. House Speaker. It's not our intention to escalate. We, we want to continue to be built and foster democracy and freedom. And there should be no fear. Well, following the meeting, Kevin McCarthy promised America's unwavering support for Taiwan. The Taiwanese president thanked him, adding her country is facing unprecedented challenges. Officials in China are calling this visit a provocation. And that government says it plans to respond, but it did not specify how. In a visit to Poland, the Ukrainian president thanked his country's neighbor for its continued support since Russia's invasion. As Susan Ormiston tells us, as the war drags on, supplies are stretched thin. Greeted in Warsaw with full pomp and ceremony on Zelensky's first official visit to Ukraine's closest European ally, the Polish president, Andrzej Duda, gave him a hero's welcome. There's no doubt that you, Volodymyr, are an absolutely special man, he said. Awarding Zelensky the Order of the White Eagle, Poland's highest honor, Zelensky returned the praise. You've not abandoned Ukraine, he said. I believe there's historic strength between our countries. He needs his allies as the war voraciously consumes military aid. The fight in Bakhmut, Zelensky said, is difficult, but Russia has not taken control. As Ukraine received the first of about a dozen MiG fighter jets promised by Poland. In a contested and dangerous world, we cannot take our security for granted. In Brussels, NATO's Secretary General meeting with foreign ministers urged countries to up their spending to NATO to 2% of GDP minimum. Canada is well below that. As war is back in Europe, as tensions are flaring in the Indo-Pacific, we need to make sure that we step up our game and that's what we'll do. Does that mean that Canada will step up its game to minimum 2% of defence spending for NATO? We're undergoing a very important defence policy review, which is required before announcing any further investments. Jolie was clear that Canada and others are asking China to press Vladimir Putin to engage in peace talks as a flurry of heads of states descend on Beijing this week, meeting with Chinese President Xi. And I think China could certainly help in making sure to say clearly first to Russia to get out of Ukraine, and second, to take the phone call from President Zelensky. But so far, even with the strongest of allies, diplomacy has not deterred Russia's brutal intent. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney is recovering after being treated for prostate cancer. Mulroney's daughter says her father is now doing well and should be back to normal life in a matter of weeks. His family says the procedures were tough and they're thankful for the outpouring of support. CBC News has uncovered new concerns about the investigations into alleged foreign meddling in Canadian elections. Committees looking into the matter have been denied access to private cabinet records. And as Murray Brewster explains, that is raising questions about government transparency. The federal cabinet room. What happens here is supposed to stay here. That is at odds with the marching orders for two review agencies looking into what Ottawa knew about alleged Chinese election interference in Canada. Today I spoke with David McGuinty, the head of NSICA, and uh, with Marie Deschamps, the head of NSIRA. I underscored that Canadians need to have faith in their institutions and deserve answers and transparency. NSICOP, a multi-party committee of MPs and senators sworn to secrecy that reviews intelligence activities. 
and Sierra, an independent national security review agency. Both don't have access to secret cabinet documents, something that's created problems in past NCOP investigations. And so we have gently but persuasively worked with the Privy Council Office and the Prime Minister's team to say, no, sorry, uh, you have to start working with us more openly. And on behalf of Canadians, uh, they need to, to know as much as we can inform them. The reviews will help the Prime Minister's special rapporteur, David Johnston, decide on a public inquiry. The federal department in charge of cabinet secrets says Johnston will get to see everything, including cabinet confidences, where necessary. But there is no similar guarantees for the committees. And CIRA should have access to cabinet confidences because they are there to look at the flow of information to decision makers, whereas uh, Enstacop is really looking at the activities of the agencies uh, themselves, CSIS and CSE. Experts say you can't promise transparency, but then say you can't look at that. The government had best get ahead of it now because it's not something that's going to be going away. And just from an optics perspective, it doesn't look great. There is precedent for waiving cabinet secrecy. Last summer, the Liberal government allowed the commission investigating the invocation of the Emergencies Act to look at what cabinet did and didn't know about the convoy protest. Marie Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada's largest grocery chain is defending boosting its CEO's pay while questions swirl about how much shoppers pay. It's not just about profit, it doesn't go to me. But will it turn consumers away? How can he get a raise when we're paying too much for food? The Prime Minister's official home is a piece of Canadian heritage, but now it has a major rat problem. And wedding bells in the middle of a media circus. We finished the ceremony, and right as we walked out, someone said, Trump just got out, Trump just got out. The moment you didn't see. We're back in two. For decades, 24 Sussex Drive was synonymous with Canadian power and prestige. Now it is a literal rat's nest. As newly released documents reveal mold, asbestos, and a severe rodent infestation prompted its closure five months ago. Justin Trudeau refused to move into the official residence when he was first elected. Today, he said its fate is not up to him. I made the decision a number of years ago uh, not uh, to move into that house. I know there have been uh, ongoing consultations and important processes to balance uh, the historical heritage nature of that building. Uh, those conversations are continuing within the NCC and uh, the Department of Public Works. Debate over what to do with a crumbling residence has dragged on for years and through several governments. The National Capital Commission now estimates the price tag to repair it is almost $40 million. Now, the price tag of your groceries continues to soar, and the paycheck of the man who runs the biggest grocery store chain in the country is also going up. Nisha Patel takes us through the numbers. So you're going to flip over this. Galen Weston is one of Canada's most recognizable CEOs. As the face of Loblaws, Superstore and No Frills, he's also one of the most scrutinized. Now it's his paycheck that's making headlines. As the Globe and Mail first reported, Weston earned a total of $11.79 million in 2022, an increase of more than a million dollars from the year before. After Loblaw hired consultants that determined he was underpaid. I think what the board of directors deems him his salary appropriate is what they should pay him. How can he get a raise when we're paying too much for food? Canadians have focused their frustration over soaring food prices on the grocery giants though executives insist they're not taking advantage of inflation to boost prices. It's not just about profit. It doesn't go to me. It goes, the, it goes back into this country. Loblaw says Weston's compensation is in line with other grocery executives. This business professor argues CEOs are highly skilled and should be compensated accordingly. Is this pay raise justified? Um, the... There's a market, a competitive market for superstars, whether it's entertainers, musicians, uh, athletes, CEOs, there is a supply and a demand and you pay the market price or you lose them. 
That may be tough to hear for many Loblaw employees whose paychecks haven't even kept up with inflation. They can't afford to shop where they work. People ought to be compensated vis-a-vis their uh, skills and the value that they bring to the company. I mean, you can't argue with that. But the question is, when does the gap become so much so as it is morally offensive? A gap that seems to be growing between those who work in the corner office and those who work at the checkout. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Families of those who died in a massive fire in old Montreal are demanding to know, could it have easily been prevented? A simple battery in a fire alarm and he would be here. The exclusive interviews with families now grieving lost loved ones and new details about an attack to stop a controversial pipeline. Who do you think is responsible for that attack? I don't have an idea. Do you understand why I might find that hard to believe? Now police say they are zeroing in on the group they think is responsible. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Well, it took nearly three weeks, but Quebec is now moving forward with a public inquiry into that deadly fire in old Montreal. Some of the questions that remain, were there working smoke alarms? Was the building up to code? Family members of the victims are among those demanding answers, and some of those grieving relatives sat down exclusively with Sarah Levitt. What's been foremost on your mind these past two and a half weeks? Foremost on my mind has been my brother. Um, he doesn't leave my side. Uh, since the moment that I found out uh, that he was in that building. Thoughts of him and just the feeling of him being around have been constant. In the early hours of March 16th, a fire broke out in this old Montreal Heritage Building, ripping through the wood interior. Nine people managed to get out. At first, it wasn't clear who hadn't. For two days, firefighters said only one person was missing, Camille Mayer, a longtime tenant of the building. It then became clear six others were also unaccounted for, all of whom had been staying in Airbnbs. Sanya Khan, Dania Safar, Charlie Lacroix, Anne Wu, Walid Belkala, and Nathan Sears. This picture is so representative of my brother. Nathan was an academic, renowned for his work in international studies. He was in Montreal for a conference. Every morning, he would wake up and try to be the best version of Nathan that he could be in all of the hats that he wore in this life. The first 24 hours after the fire, Nathan's family say, were filled with confusion, disbelief and hope. Where was he? Was he in the building? Did he manage to escape? We all started to unite in Montreal as fast as possible. And we collectively spent the next nine days in Montreal, uh, essentially having a vigil at the site of the fire. The site would become a gathering place for the families and friends of those who died in the fire. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking with me. I appreciate it. Among those who stood vigil, and Wu's parents, it was a long journey from Tongling, China, to get there. Can you tell me what it's been like for you? When we learned it was a fire, her mother says, we panicked. Again and again, we tried to reach her, to no avail. Like Nathan, 31-year-old Ann Wu was also an academic, a neuroscientist also in town for another conference. High correlation to the lunch movement. She decided to rent an Airbnb and stay in Montreal for one more day. Born under China's one-child policy, her parents say they did everything they could so she could achieve her dreams. This hurts so much, her father says. For us, Montreal is a place of heartbreak and indignation. 
Uncertain what to do immediately after the fire, friends enlisted the help of a conference organizer to search the hospitals for Anne. They didn't find her. A week and a half after the fire, Nathan, Anne and two other victims were finally identified. Desperate for answers, Nathan's father, Randy, interrupted a press conference with Montreal's mayor. More and more information about the building was coming to light. At least three of the people who escaped said no fire alarms went off. Inside, several Airbnbs were being rented, illegal in that part of old Montreal. And the family of 18-year-old Charlie Lacroix, who also died, described her call to 911 that night, where she said she was in a room without any windows. The coroner told the families that both Anne and Nathan died of smoke inhalation. The investigation into the fire continues, but Nathan's family believe there was no working fire alarm or smoke detector in his room. The thing that we have repeated the most, probably, in the last few days anyway, was that a simple battery in a fire alarm, and he would be here. It's so simple. So, Sarah, this is really wrenching, but also really important to hear from them. And there have been some important decisions made since the fire, including that public inquiry announcement. And leading that, Adrian, is the coroner who's been involved in the ongoing police investigation. Meanwhile, Nathan Spears' family, they've uh, applied for a class action lawsuit on behalf of the victims. They're seeking damages from the building owner, the person who was running the short-term rental, as well as Airbnb itself. And, you know, Brittany Sears told me it, it is about getting closure, but the most important thing for her is that other families don't have to go through this. Indeed. Sarah Levitt in Montreal, thank you. Thank you. Police say they are closing in on suspects who destroyed the site of a contentious pipeline. Are you suggesting that the people who were involved had some sort of attachment to the anarchist movement? Absolutely. The exclusive new details into a year-long investigation. Next. New details are emerging about an attack on the work site of the coastal gas link pipeline in northern BC. The contentious project spans over vast unceded territory of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. In February last year, attackers smashed equipment and buildings causing millions of dollars in damage. Police say staff were also threatened with axes and flares. This happened on a site 60 kilometers south of Houston, B.C., where workers were helping build a natural gas pipeline that would stretch 670 kilometers across the province. Now, hereditary chiefs have long opposed the pipeline, but they say they are not responsible for this attack. So the question remains, who is? Tonight, some answers from Rob Brown, who traveled to the territory and has exclusive details about the police investigation. Between the North Coast Mountains and the Bulkley Valley lies a glacier-fed river that is breathtaking in its beauty. But in recent years, it's also been the scene of ugly confrontation. A series of RCMP raids on protesters defying a court order. And with every raid, the temperature rose until things boiled over and led to this. But who would go so far and why? I know we would never, ever tell anybody or support anybody to do any kind of damage. Hereditary Chief John Risdale wants to show us what the battle here is all about. The Wet'suwet'en call it Wet'senkwa. Wet'senkwa means blue, green, pure river. Couldn't be more clear from here. It's beautiful. But when he reaches the river's edge, he finds the water is far from clear. That seems awful dirty for this time of year. Just upstream, crews are tunneling under the riverbed to make way for a section of the coastal gas link pipeline. He's been trying to get up close. Security won't let him. I don't need to make arrangements with anybody. I'm Chief Namox, and this is what's old in territory. But Chief Namox is turned away because the work site is also a crime scene. They emerge from the forest around midnight in February of last year. 
firing flare guns and swinging axes into the side of security trucks. An excavator on site was used to destroy other heavy machinery and mobile trailers. The estimated damage as high as $20 million. It was planned, it was practiced, and carried out in a very methodical manner. Chief Superintendent John Brewer is in charge of the Community Industry Response Group, or CURG, an RCMP unit formed to police resistance to the pipeline and other projects like it. Eight months after the worksite attack, the CURG was also targeted in a late-night arson attack. Four RCMP vehicles and some others nearby destroyed. It wasn't always like this. For more than a decade, protests against the pipeline had been peaceful. But the last RCMP raid in the fall of 2021 marked a major turning point. For the first time in the conflict, the protesters were charged with criminal contempt of court. And at the same time, Coastal GasLink was finally able to ramp up operations here. That's when things turned violent down at the work site. That was more than a year ago. RCMP had 40 investigators on the case. A $100,000 reward had been posted. And the attackers are still out there. How close are you to making an arrest, so timeline-wise? I, I, I have been saying to my team, we are weeks away for the last few months, uh, certainly before the new year. Um, I believe we are that close. This is the first time he's revealing key details of the investigation into the worksite attack, saying police have identified more than half a dozen suspects and have been tracking their movements. Examining videos like this one the protesters posted just weeks before the attack. A masked and camo-wearing group pulling trees and tires across the road. Was it a rehearsal? They're the same impediments officers encountered trying to get up the only road to the worksite that night. So how did the attackers escape, if not down that road? Police say the group fled the worksite on snowmobiles, using the pipeline right of way, which runs parallel to the road. When they reached a protest camp, the attackers made their getaway in waiting trucks. While police were still busy assessing the threat at the worksite and securing the crime scene. Investigators later recovered DNA evidence there. The destruction also holding clues. Not everyone knows how to operate an excavator, and police know who among the protesters can. But after more than a year of investigating, the Mounties have concluded that it's not the local group that planned the attack. John Brewer believes it was orchestrated and largely executed by outside forces. Are you suggesting that the people who are involved, the suspects that you have in the worksite attack, came and infiltrated the group, that's the word you just used, and had some sort of attachment to the anarchist movement, such as it is in Canada? Yeah, I think, I think it's safe to say whether they are directly part of the anarchist movement or believe in it or use their tactics, absolutely. No one has claimed responsibility for the worksite attack, but an anonymous post on an anarchist website did take credit for the arson. The same website where credit was taken for damage to drilling equipment at a Calgary storage yard. The latest posting, a claim of sabotage, that before they were buried, some pipes had tiny holes drilled into them. Far from infiltrating the local protest group, anarchists were actually invited. Hi, I'm Rob. The chief took us yes. to meet Molly Wickham. Which do you prefer, oh, Molly or Slato? Uh, okay. kind of the local protest style. leader who goes by uh, Slato so has called for anarchists to join the cause. Calling on you, our allies, other indigenous nations, labor unions, anarchist groups. You called for people from oh, yeah. that movement to be a part of this movement. Oh yeah, we have a lot of uh, people that we've worked with in the past that are amazing, great human beings. But may have participated in that. So do you feel some responsibility for that then, if you called for them to come here? Absolutely not. Who do you think is responsible for that attack? I don't have an idea. Do you understand why I might find that hard to believe? <laughs> yes, okay. I do. Were because you a part we've of it? Been here, absolutely not. 
And why wouldn't you have a sense of who would be behind that? They were clearly doing it in solidarity with yeah, I think I think that there's a lot of resistance to this project that is outside of ourselves. You know, I don't so who are the outsiders? Police aren't saying who their suspects are, and we don't know. We did pull the court documents on every arrest made in the conflict zone, and the details are revealing. About 70% of the people taken into custody were not from this area. Some were from other parts in BC, others, other provinces, and even the US. And more than one of them had ties to the anarchist movement. Our nation was hijacked. Our nation's name was hijacked. They've taken our name and put it in a bad spotlight all across Canada. Bonnie George works for Coastal Gaslink. She's also Wet'suwet'en and believes the violence has done lasting damage to her people, saying many protesters feel the same and have left the movement. The community members were just, just disgusted by what happened. We've got uh, 540 kilometers of pipe already in the ground on the project. So this is Coastal Gaslink says the pipeline is now 85% complete. But police believe as long as work on the pipeline continues, the threat of violence here remains. The tunneling under the pure water of Wedzengkwa should be finished by June. Where the fight to protect the river goes then is far less clear. So Rob, the references to this anarchist movement in your story, in a sense is movement not a bit of a misnomer here? Yeah, it really is, yeah. I mean, this by their very nature, this isn't a group of people who join an organization per se, Adrian. It's really a collection of individuals who adhere to and then act on an ideology. Police say that number is very small in Canada. We've been in contact with one such person, originally from Ottawa, now lives in Mexico, where he publishes an anarchist newsletter. This is a guy with a history in Quebec, the States, and BC, was arrested in Wet'suwet'en territory for assault on a police officer with a weapon. That charge stayed. He has yet to answer our direct questions about that worksite attack, Adrian. Just briefly, uh, it sounds like work on the pipeline is actually pretty advanced. Any sense of when it will be completed? Companies hoping within the calendar year, this is a project that's faced lots of delays and is way over budget, more than two times over the original estimate, now sits at a cost of $14 billion, Adrian. All right, Rob Brown in Calgary, thank you. You bet. Next, a courthouse wedding with Donald Trump right next door. We just took it in stride and saw a lot of humor in it. Well, he was saying not guilty. They were saying I do in our moment. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, BC's new housing plan could mean the end of single family home neighborhoods. But will it make housing any more affordable? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, this is now a historic moment. That's Donald Trump, of course, entering a New York court for his arraignment. Pretty chaotic scene with police, protesters, and media packing the street. It also, as it turns out, was the scene of wedding ceremonies. Dozens of couples were scheduled to be married right around the corner, including a pair from Texas. Their unforgettable day is our moment. We thought that, to some extent, it was a funny situation. High school sweethearts Chandler Dean and Carolina Trevino made a plan to tie the knot at a Manhattan courthouse. And that plan happened to fall on the same day and nearly the precise same spot as Donald Trump's arraignment. Awkward. We just took it in stride and saw a lot of humor in it. Um, yeah, it was definitely chaotic, but not so much so that we couldn't get in. The couple scheduled their wedding back in May, flying in from Texas for the nuptials. We wanted to do the legal ceremony here in what we thought might be a more uh, intimate and low-key uh, circumstance. Naturally, this was anything but low-key. Media and protesters filled the street. We finished the ceremony, and right as we walked out, someone said, Trump just got out, Trump just got out. But the newlyweds say they have no regrets. To us, like, it was a way that made the day a little bit more memorable. And if anything, people were just like, I think delighted at the fact that despite the chaos, love continues on. Yeah, like who cares, <laughs> it's New York, there's something happening here yeah. every day. 
I mean, not something always like that, but you're right. Um, you know, the <laughs> can you imagine being the person who realized, honey, I think, do you see what's happening on our wedding day? Do you see where it's happening? I think it's, I think they are fantastic. That is a national for April the 5th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.